why is the divorce rate so high? Because ah, everybody thinks it's supposed to be easy to be in a relationship. And you know the expression, you have to work in a relationship. Marriage and family therapist Dr. Jane Greer is a GalTime.com contributor. Jane is a marriage and family therapist, sex expert. She's recognized as a leading national expert in sex, love, and relationships. The author of five books, including What About Me? Stop Selfishness from Ruining Your Relationship. And How Could You Do This to Me? Learning to Trust After Betrayal. She's the radio host of Doctor on Call Hour, featuring pop psych Let's Talk Sex. What point you're like, okay, this marriage is not savable. What are some, like, maybe some traits usually the marriage has become sexless on some level for an extended period of time and for whatever the reason one person just is completely sexually disconnected do men or women cheat more i would say 48 percent women 52 percent men are cheating at least from what i've seen women are unfaithful just as men are why is the divorce rate so high because ah, everybody thinks it's supposed to be easy to be in a relationship. And you know the expression, you have to work in a relationship. Mm. Well, everybody thinks, no, we don't. It should be easy. We're com they think pe people think they're communicating if they talk to each other or tell the other person what they think of them. They think that's good communication. And it is not. It will lead to attacking and blaming and criticism. And it requires skill. It requires mm -hmm. effort. It requires dedication. It requires energy. It requires patience to invest in making a relationship work and working on a relationship. So mm -hmm. as a result, because people don't know how to do it, Anger and disappointment builds up. Mm. And after a point when there's too much anger and too much resentment, the dam breaks and the relationship implodes, the marriages implode. And, you know, the person you started out loving is the person that you hate. And, you know, you just, they're making your life miserable and you want to get out. That's why. Mm. So it sounds like maybe people should really, first of all, see if they're willing to put that commitment first, right? Like having, you know, maybe like we're brainwashed by Hollywood that, oh, marriages is so easy, you know, like it's so, it's so amazing. It, you don't have to put in that much effort. So maybe there's that element, but also maybe it might be worth for people to take some classes before they get married, right? You said it. What a great point. And there should be marriage 101. To your point about Hollywood and brainwashing, you know, I forgot to mention I'm also a sex therapist. Mm. And so I do a lot of work with couples and intimacy and sex and individuals and sexual desire. And, you know, in the movies, it's hot and heavy and fabulous. You're up against a wall. It's happening instantaneously. You're just drowning in desire. Well, I'll never forget, I had one of my patients years ago, to this day we laugh about it, she came and she said, well, my husband and I, we were going to have sex at the pool. She said to me, it was horrible. <laughs> I'm lying in the ground, the bugs are eating me, the ants are crawling, the grass is scratching, the pavement is hard. She's going on to describe all the reality elements of sex in a pool. Mm -hmm. She said, it's anything but what they show you in Hollywood. And the, the same thing is true with sex. It, it, it's lovely in the movies where it's just like combustion and it happens, but that is not the reality of sexual intimacy and people who are in a relationship for any period of time. It requires effort, getting to know your partner, know what they like, be willing to Give them what they like without feeling they're telling you what to do or controlling you. I mean, it's a whole lot of work, basically. Yeah, those are really good points. You know, every uh, chick flick film, <laughs> to lack of a better word, um, you know, kind of goes over that. You know, like they, it's like it's amazing, it's glittery, it's uh, attractive, really? <laughs> and it's like dreamy. You know, and so people don't see the the dirt, the the hard part of relationships, which is the effort and the patience and the skill, like you mentioned. So let's say someone, well, 
Go for it. Well said. <laughs> mm-hmm. So let's say there's a couple out there that wants to put in the effort to improve their relationship. They want to prevent divorce, but they lack the skill. What are some maybe things that they can do to improve their skills? I mean, high impact, you know, here's where to start things that they could, um, they could start implementing. Well, without plugging myself, I will plug my book (laughs) and say, my book, What About Me? Stop Selfishness from Ruining Your Relationship is a great read because it's user-friendly and it's loaded with user-friendly skills based on those which I taught many of the couples that I work with that are easy to remember and easy to apply. For example, I say, put down the bat the blame, the attack, and the triggering your partner by going for their Achilles heel to get them crazy, you mm-hmm. know, telling them they're they're fat or they're stupid. You do go in for the low blow, right? Mm-hmm. And play the ace of hearts. Acknowledge their feelings, consider why they're upset, and empathize with them mm-hmm. so that you relate to how they're feeling. And most people are in combat and bat each other over the head. And then they think they're going to work it out and talk. And that's not how it goes. So you really need to work at putting the skill into your mind and using it mindfully so that you just don't go into, you know, people get angry and they think that the point of their anger or the goal of their anger is to tell the other person they're mad and let them know what they did wrong and what they want to change. No, I teach people all the time. The point of your anger is that something is not working. So you have to talk with your partner about what didn't work. And the objective is, let's put our heads together and figure out what can we do differently next time so it doesn't happen again. It's moving, using your anger to figure out what was wrong, what was missing, to problem solve so it doesn't continue to happen. Then you're getting mileage out of your anger. Otherwise, your anger is just like gasoline in the street that's not going to take you anywhere. Put it in your gas tank, go wherever you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like there's a lot of collaboration that needs to happen, you know, between the couple. Um, Let's say that, you know, what if you hear it all the time, like, oh, maybe one uh, spouse wants to go and improve the relationship and one doesn't want to go to like the therapist and, and work with them. Like you go yourself. I don't want to be a part of that. So what if there's one couple that, or, you know, one spouse that doesn't want to put in the work, you know, how can they go around that? Perfect question. Well, I've had that many a time. One mm-hmm. person comes in and they'll say to me, you're never going to get my husband in here, or mm-hmm. you're never going to get my wife to come in to which I say, you're absolutely right. I am not going to get your husband in here. You are. I'm not going to get your wife in here. You are. Because you're going to learn how to advocate for your needs, how to speak to what's important to you, and how to very clearly deliver the message of what you are looking for from them and what will happen for you if it doesn't happen and if it does happen and how life will be different accordingly. I've never had an instance where the one person who came in first was not able to recruit their partner ever. Mm. Wow. Ever, ever, ever. (laughs) Yeah. Because they all learn how to speak up Mm. and advocate for themselves and speak their truth and their partners join them. Mm. So. So it's a matter of communication. Like the person never really spoke up for themselves. Maybe they internalize their feelings but never communicated it to their spouse and now you're kind of in there helping them you know enabling them to do so right but also saying it in a way that's not i really want you to come you have to come <laughs> saying in a way that packs a punch mm-hmm. if you're not going to join me in marriage counseling i don't see how our marriage is going to survive And so if you really are willing to say that this is the end of the road, fine, you don't need to come in. But if you want to do anything to see if we can make this marriage work, then why wouldn't you join me? 
I had my favorite story. I had a couple many years ago. And the husband came in with the wife the first time and they're sitting there and she's like, she's got all these issues and she's complaining. And of course he wants no part of it. So he says to me, I don't see why I have to be here. If we have to work, like I said earlier, if we have to work at the marriage, then forget it. It's, it shouldn't be. There's something wrong with it. Mm -hmm. So I said to him, okay, fine. You don't want to work at the marriage? Fine. Then let's work at dismantling your marriage and taking it apart. And the two of you can get separated and divorced. I said, so let's just take a look at what that's going to be. Well, you're going to have to divide your finances, you're going to have to go over that. You're going to have to start to work out the logistics around your kids and childcare. You're going to probably have to move out because the kids aren't going anywhere. And you're going to have to move into an apartment because you're not going to be able to afford two homes. I said, and you know, and then you're going to be single. Now, how long do you think you want to stay single? Are you planning if you end this marriage to stay single forever? Or do you think you're going to start dating and get back in a relationship? And if you start dating, you've been married for 15 years. Do you know what it's like to put yourself out there and be a single man dating? And he's listening to me. I said, and then, you know, let's say you meet somebody. You're going to have all the issues of being involved and being in a relationship that you want no part of. So pick your poison. So he looks at me, he says, let's work on the marriage. <laughs> <laughs> and for the record, Years ago, Ladies Home Journal did a column called Can This Marriage Be Saved? They did so spectacularly that they were, can this marriage be saved? He was so happy. He made such great changes. She made changes. It, it was really terrific. But he had to see the picture. Nobody gets a pass. You got to do the work. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to work on the marriage, work on getting out of the marriage. But, you know, pick your poison. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it kind of reminds me of there's, I think, a uh, study that they did with mice, and they put almost, you know, food that mice like to, I don't know if it's a carrot or something in front of it, and they tested it, and they put a string on the tail and see how hard it would tug to get the food. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, it put a cat right behind the mice. <laughs> and you can believe that it was tugging super hard, right? It's like didn't want to get eaten. Yeah, and right. So it sounds like, you know, people had not just inspiration of what a marriage could be, but also the bad part of what it could be, like you laying out exactly what would happen and the hardships that would they have to, you know, overcome with getting a divorce. That that's a good motivator as well to, you know, help people work on the marriage. Well, exactly right. Well said. It's you know, people just reach a a kind of a breaking point they're unhappy and they want out and they're so angry and they lose faith and they don't trust that their partner is going to change so they want out but they don't necessarily have a realistic sense of what being out entails mm. and all the energy and time and effort that's going to go into it and so it's helpful to know and you know look if I mean, obviously, I've worked with many couples who have reached a point where the marriage is over for a variety of reasons. And then we are looking at how do we dismantle it? How do we take it apart? How do you both get out and maintain a certain, you know, dignity and balance? Mm. But for a lot of people, they come to see somebody like myself because nobody gets married with the, with the expectation that it's going to fail and it's not going to work. We get married for better, for worse for rich or poor, for happily ever after. And, you know, with the right skill sets, it, it's like trying to eat steak with a plastic fork and knife. You need, a, you need a knife and a fork to cut through. And if you have the right tools, you can get through the tough part. So. Mm. So you mentioned sometimes you're working with couples that it's just totally over and you're helping dismantle it at what point does that happen you know what what point you're like okay this marriage is not savable what are some like maybe some traits of a marriage where it's unredeemable and maybe some traits of a marriage that is still redeemable well it's not my decision it's the people's decision where it's you know unsalvageable mm -hmm. and 
usually the marriage has become sexless on some level for an extended period of time. And for whatever the reason, one person just is completely sexually disconnected. And oftentimes that's a result of layers and layers and layers of resentment and anger and disappointment. And there's such a buildup of anger and resentment and disappointment and broken trust. Just not having the belief or the faith that what your partner tells you they're going to change, they're going to do it, they're sorry, you don't believe it. So there's nothing to hold on to, like hanging a coat on the wall without a hook, just going to fall. Um, salvageable is when people want it to work. They have the anger, they have, they have the misunderstandings, they still want the other person to understand them and relate to them. They're not consumed with their anger. You know, in my What About Me book, I talk about love you mean at moments and hate you mean at moments. When you live with somebody, you know, there are a lot of moments where you just love them. Oh, she's so thoughtful. Oh, he's so nice. Oh, he's so this. Oh, she's so that. And then you have what I call the hate you mean at moments where they say or do something annoying or irritating. And I mean, I've had a thousand people say, I want to kill him. I hate her. I can't stand her. You feel that in the moment. But the goal is that the love you mean at moments trump the hate you mean at moments, that there are enough love you mean it to help you tolerate, oh, I hate that person. When it becomes the opposite, when the hate you mean at moments become front and center, you're heading down the rabbit hole. Mm. So it seems like a lot of the hate comes from the person not in you know, their spouse, not changing or, you know, they, they have the mistrust of their spouse. If the spouse ends up changing it, does that reverse it? Or is it at a point where it's irreversible? They just, that's how they feel it, and it's over. It depends. it depends. It depends on how many times they've been through the cycle of, I promise I'll change mm. and how long they have sustained it. So a lot of times people say, I'll change when they start to feel threatened that their spouse wants to end things. I'll change, I promise. And they do for two, three months. And then they go back to their behavior. Mm. So if that's happened a number of times, their partner loses faith and belief that they really mean it. It's like lip service. They're saying they're going to change, but they're not. Um, but if they sustain it, it, it could work. Although I have seen marriages where one person finally gets it mm. and they start to make the changes but their partner's already checked out and it doesn't matter. They just, they, you know, uh, you've lost that loving feeling. They can't get it back. Mm. And it's, it's too late. You know, I, I've seen that. I see that frankly, more when the women leave the men mm. where, where wives leave husbands who they've been telling for years, how unhappy they are. I need your help. I need your support. I'm upset about this. On and on and on and on. So what happens in a marriage is people complain. They tell their spouse what they're unhappy about. And then life goes on and you go back to your routine of marriage. So the spouse thinks, all right, they're off my back. Everything's fine. You can go a lot of years like that. So the complaining person is not complaining constantly. So the other person thinks, eh, they're not so mad. It's not so big a deal. 10 years later, they're done. Mm -hmm. And this person is surprised because they can't believe it's really that bad that their spouse is leaving them. But it is, and they do. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. so you mentioned that it's more, you see this scenario more with the wife leaving the man. So. Are there approaches that, you know, different approaches men and women should take when improving a marriage? I think it all comes down to the same thing. It's listening to your partner mm -hmm. and taking them at face value and not 
dismissing it three days later because they're not complaining in your face. In other words, just because they're not complaining to you Mm -hmm. not mean they're not upset with you right and a lot of times people misread the landscape they think if their partner is not complaining and angry overtly at them for being late for leaving the dishes in the sink for whatever then they're accepting them or it's not bothering them that is not the case Mm -hmm. they're just not complaining and when somebody reaches a point where they completely stop complaining. That's what I call the cheating zone. Mm. That's when they become vulnerable to somebody saying, Hey, you look nice. Well, you (laughs) did a good job. That was, that was, you did a great job with that. Somebody suddenly shows an interest in them and pays attention and they start to feel good and they start to forget how annoyed and angry and resentful they are. And voila. We have infidelity. Interesting. So let's talk about cheating um, and infidelity. Do men or women cheat more? Or is there even study? It's pretty pretty equal. Uh, In in my experience, of of all the, I would say 48% women, 52% men Hmm. were cheating. You know, Leastways, from what I've seen, women are unfaithful just as men are. Men used to have more of an opportunity. Women, because of the changing societal roles and work, have had more opportunity. So I, I think it it varies. And the same the the, the rates with cheating does not mean it's the end of your marriage. Cheating for, for many relationships can be the catalyst which helps couples get back to higher ground, strengthen and renew their vows and make their marriage healthier and stronger than ever. Hmm. Interesting. So is there a, do men and women cheat for different reasons or is it pretty much the same as well? Pretty much the same. You know, with a lot of people, a lot of times the men will say they wish their wives were relating to them the way the lover is. And the women will say the same thing. They wish their husbands were relating to to them the way their lover is. Um, It's about emotional neglect and sexual neglect. You know, I mean, sex is a big part of infidelity, but emotional bonding is a huge part feeling that somebody sees you, that they care about you, that you're attractive to them, feeling good about yourself, desirable, all of which you don't get when you're in an unhappy marriage or an empty marriage. It's a self-esteem booster. Mm -hmm. Your sexual esteem goes up. Mm -hmm. Up home and your partner doesn't want to have sex with you, goes down, (laughs) you know. Mm -hmm. You meet a lover, goes up. Mm-hmm. So you, you mentioned that if there is cheating in relationship, it's not the all and be all, and it can actually enhance the relationship. Um, but then you hear a lot of people saying like, once a cheater, always a cheater, right? They have, you know, you hear that, or at least um, I see that often on social media, you know, whenever a random video pops up and it's like someone cheating. So what are your thoughts on that? And why why are people so fixated on that belief? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't think that's the case at all. I think that depends on what's driving the person to cheat and what their personality is. Obviously, if there's a sexual addictive component, once a cheater, always a cheater. But mm. Most people cheat because they're unhappy at a certain point in that relationship. A lot of times they get discovered because they unconsciously want to. So they leave pictures out or they leave a phone out because they don't, it's too much to carry on the duplicity. And the cheating is a way of rebuilding trust and reinvesting energy back in the the relationship or the marriage. 
And that's what happens. They, they do that. And here's the deal. For many couples, a third person comes into the relationship because there's too much space between the people. There's too big an emotional gap. If you're connected to your partner, I mean, we're all tempted. We all would like to do what we want to do on any given day, stay in bed an extra hour, eat what we want to eat, spend the money we want to spend. But we have impulse control and judgment. And we say, if I do that, then this, I'm not going to. So the same thing is true. We see people, we flirt. Are we tempted to be involved? Are people tempted? Yeah, but we say, you know what? If I go sleep with that person, I jeopardize my relationship. I'm not going to. So it becomes something flattering. And people learn to and, and are able to keep a third person out of the relationship when there's a strong enough bond with their partner. They take that sexy flirtation home and sleep with their partner. They feel good. They feel they're, you know, they're attractive and they go sleep with their partner. When there's a big gap, somebody else can step in. And that's what happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that kind of reminds me of, um, you know, like there's this always this uh, debate back and forth. It's like, can men and women be friends? <laughs> you know, that's <laughs> so what are your thoughts on that? Is it they can be friends if, you know, they're both secure in their relationship or one person secure in the relationship? But if they're not secure in the relationship, it, they can't be friends. Like, what are your thoughts on that? It's funny. Uh, years back, I actually um, was part of a video on when Harry met Sally talking about exactly this point. Can when men and women be friends? You know, absolutely. Men and women can be friends when they're happily married to other people. Might there be an attraction? Sure. But again, an attraction is just flattering as long as it's contained and not threatening. If there, if the relationship is has holes for people to fall into, can you be friends? Yeah, but typically one person might start to be more attracted or push the envelope a little bit. But, but many men and women are friends and safely and supportively and lovingly and caringly. Absolutely. Yeah, so it seems like there needs to be a high level of trust, you know, between a marriage in order to work like you mentioned a few times you know distrust that's when it starts to break right and so if someone is feeling distrust how can that spouse really build that trust again well so when there's been infidelity and cheating the hallmark of it is that it's cloaked in secrecy your partner, you don't know where they're going. You don't know when they're coming back. You never see their phone. If you accuse them of anything, they tell you you're being ridiculous. They don't let you see their emails. You, you, you don't know what's going on. In the aftermath of infidelity, when it's been discovered, everything has to be front and center. Everything is the complete opposite. You have to basically put your computer on the table so your partner can see what you're writing, who you're emailing. Your phone has to be an open book. I remember I had um, a husband. He used to meet his lover on Saturdays at the grocery store. So when he was going on Saturday at noon, he'd say to the wife, you want to come with me now? You have to disclose and reveal. And that's the only way to build trust back. You have to be open, the complete opposite of how you were. And it takes time. Trust does not come back easily. When there's been infidelity, it starts with an apology. That's just the beginning. Without the behaviors to punctuate the trust, not going to happen. You know, and you have to continue to relate to the pain of your betrayal, which you put your partner through, and tolerate repeatedly their, their hurt and their anger. How could you do this to me? That was the title of my book. How could you do this to me? Mm -hmm. Learning to trust after betrayal because you're so hurt that they would break your trust and as i said i've seen many many couples who are devoted and dedicated to keeping their marriage and making it stronger and better rebuild the trust 
So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really powerful. You know, like the time, time is important with rebuilding trust. Um, the apology seems like the easy part, but the most difficult part is the behavior change, you know, because we're all creatures of habit and we've built these behaviors from years and years of repetition. So have you found a method or a, some sort of process for people that want to change, but, you know, have a hard time? Like what is a good process or method that they can use to help them change their behaviors? Therapy. Mm. <laughs> so therapy is. Therapy is a process that helps you change your behavior. It becomes uh, a process of insight, self-awareness, practice, um, learning the skills, and then being able to integrate it all. That's my method. Go to therapy. Come see me. You will learn how to change your behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I, I do like that because there's another person there that will help you. You know, because I think oftentimes in life, people feel like they're in alone or they want to do it on their own, but having a partner there to help them or someone that can guide them, the right. accountability partner could really enhance your success. Well, not only enhance it, but facilitate it. it right. you, you can want to change if you don't know how to, that's what Weight Watchers is. People want to lose weight, but they don't know how. Right. So it's a process. It's it's like a, a weight loss therapy. You go, they weigh you, they teach you, they educate you about the foods to eat. They support you, they encourage you, and you lose weight. You know, but one of the hardest things, the last thing I will say, because I am, I, I, I am conscious I have a patient that I'm going to have to go to, but one of the more difficult things with infidelity is that when you've cheated on a partner, they are, they get, they go in the loop of how could you do this to me? They, the, the pain, the, the imagining you with the other person. It's like, it's always like an open wound. So they will oftentimes bring it up. How could you do this to me? Needing the apology. Now, most of the time, the person who cheats does not want to hear it. They've said they're sorry and they don't want to be reminded about what an awful person they were. So they don't want to keep continually apologizing. In fact, every person I've ever had in my office who was cheating would start with, I'm a good person, but because nobody sees themselves as a bad person mm -hmm. because they're cheating. And what I do teach people is that, look, this is dance to the music, pay to the piper. You have to apologize. As uncomfortable as it makes you, as guilty as you feel, as badly as you feel for however long your partner is bringing up, how could you do this to me? You need to play the ace of hearts and say, acknowledge, I understand how hurtful this was. Consider the impact that your behavior had. I know the way it left you mistrustful. And I feel terrible that I put you through this. I'm so sorry. You've got to play that ace of hearts over and over and over. I was on a, um, a talk show years back and this one guy said to me, Dr. Greer, how long do I have to continue to apologize? It's two years. And I said to him, till it stops hurting her. When it stops hurting her, you won't have to apologize anymore. Mm. So. Wow, that is awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Jane Greer. Um, I feel like I can talk to you about so many more things. I know you wrote a book on the afterlife connection. That seems so interesting. Yes, I did. I'd be happy to talk with you about it at another time. I would love to. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, where can people find you? Where can people support you? That's wonderful. If you go to my website, drjanegreer.com, you can find everything there. And I would really encourage especially we're talking about cheating and marriage and relationships, the biggest variable that gets in the way of people being happy with one another is denial, is not seeing the reality of who somebody is and how they behave. So my book, Am I Lying to Myself? How to Overcome Denial and See the Truth, you can order it right on my website. Awesome. That will be put in the show notes. Thank you, everybody, for listening and watching. See you in the next episode. Bye now. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.